but works okay. Uh, yeah, I'm the technology guy. I'm the technology guy, and I just wired this together. Okay. Well, greetings and salutations. Uh, this is Retson Noor, and uh, I'm uh, calling this program the Hither and Yon program. Did you hear that phrase before, Hither and Yon? No, I have not ever heard that. Yeah, that's, uh, I didn't hear about it until I heard somebody mention it on National Public Radio, and I asked a guy at the library about it. He said, well, that means like, here and beyond, and I said, oh, well, that sounds pretty good. I guess yawn, beyond, so uh, I'm going to call this hither and beyond because we might be talking about the here and now and the beyond, and so this is the name of the program, Hither and Yawn. I'm Retson Noor, and I'm going to let my guest introduce himself. Well, my name is Hither. You're Yawn, right? Uh, we could uh, do it that way. I could be Yon. Uh, he's Hither and I'm Yon. I'm the Hither hit. from Hadley. And, and I, I'm Yon from Hadley. So uh, mm. it's not like a Scandinavian Yon. No, it's, it's more uh, like Juan, right? Like from uh, Latin America, perhaps? Uh, it's, it's more like a philosophical kind of Yon. I, I, I'm giving you a person here that is actually an Ivy League graduate, and I didn't even know what the Ivy League was. I said, well, what is the Ivy League? And he had to explain it to me. What is the Ivy League? The Ivy League? Uh, the Ivy League is comprised of eight prestigious universities, all located in the Northeast uh, geographically. Uh, I believe it's comprised of Brown University, Dartmouth College, Princeton, Harvard, Yale, Columbia, Cornell, and University of Pennsylvania, or UPenn. Now, these colleges are just in the Northeast. They don't have, like, these Ivy League colleges, like, uh, in California, because I was hearing about this uh, big college scandal, and the guy at Stanford was uh, getting all kinds of money uh, to get kids in his sailing program. I, I couldn't believe that there was a sailing program in college, but yeah. uh, sailing, I said, who 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 does sailing in college? Like uh, some kind of Ivy League people. There's nobody that does sailing. So, well, I, I, I haven't told you this, Jan, but we in the Ivy League never have scandals. They're not technically scandals. They're allegations and strong... Uh, strong uh, depositions, I would say. Okay, well, they were just talking about it on the news today that they were convicting this uh, this sailing coach from Stanford because he accepted like about a half a million dollars. Stanford, not an Ivy League college. So that's not an Ivy League college. No, so you're are, safe. You're safe. Yeah. Continue to apply to the Ivy League people. That they're, they really are prestigious and, and, and good. I think that there are some things because they're so established that are just inherently uh, difficult to deal with these days. But I think everything that has a long history is that way in some, in some respect or other. Well, the Ivy League colleges are like uh, the really expensive colleges. So uh, I'm guessing most of the people that go to these colleges uh, uh, usually have money. I thought Amherst College was an Ivy League college, but you said it's not because uh, it's not one of those uh, special colleges that have a graduate program. Right. Well, Ivy, there, okay, so Amherst College is a special college. I'll just call it that college. Uh, that college is a great college. Uh, it is considered, I believe, a little Ivy because they've taken, uh, let's say, freedom with some of the terminology. There's also, I think, different Ivy-like groups in other nations. Uh, I've heard that there's a consortium, or rather there's a group in England. There are well-established and, re and equally reputable. That's the whole idea, I guess, is they say there's a mixture of prestige, academic success, and uh, uh, uppity noses, I guess, perhaps we'll say, Jan. No, I... Uh... 
I heard that some people go to England, they're road scholars, and I don't really understand what that is. Do you know what that is? No, or, or I think Rhodes? that those are people that study cartology and uh, construction of roads. <laughs> I think it's roads, R H. I don't even know how to spell it. R H O D E S or something. Oh, it's uh, the, the Rhodes Scholar. Those are then they must go to England, and because that's how they spell roads in England. That's the old English. Spelling okay. Of road. Well, we have to uh, uh, point out that this guy is a local celebrity. He does comedy at some places around the area here, so he is uh, technically uh, a technically. little bit of a character. So uh, uh, you'll have to kind of pardon some of the uh, information here. We might have some information that might get people annoyed. I, I would say filter the information, but to those who are listening and those who aren't listening, filter everything. Okay. Well, another uh, impressive uh, fact about this person that's here, he's, his name is Martin. He likes me to say I need to park my car in Harvard Yard. He said he likes me to say that. Uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. I wouldn't mind going to Harvard, but I'd probably want to go to the Divinity School. I don't think that I want to go to the regular school because I'm into the paranormal, so I'd like to study paranormal stuff at Harvard Divinity, but I don't know if they even offer that. That's what I would call the alternative spiritual movement there as opposed to the traditional spiritual movement which would probably be uh, uh, some of these uh, established religions that they don't really believe in some of these things but I happen to believe in some of these kind of paranormal concepts uh, uh, the Indians of course uh, they they tend to uh, worship ghosts and spirits and things like that but you, we all know about the indians don't we what about the indians i'm i gonna go with native americans right okay he's that's another thing he likes to point out a political correctness here I, I no, don't call him there's a billion people that call themselves indians already but what? i am i do try to push the politically correct button a lot that's because he's an ivy leaguer He's an Ivy Leaguer. That's, and that's what was correct. the college that you went to, by the way? Uh, it was a university. Oh, and it was a university. That's yes, right. Yes, uh, it was uh, the the greatest Ivy League university, of course. The color of my skin, the color of the world, Brown University. Okay. I, I remember some guy that wrote a book. Uh, he was talking on national radio, on national public radio, I think about a year or so ago. He was talking about some of these uh, Ivy League colleges uh, years ago. Uh, the students uh, would bring their slaves to the college, so they were allowed to bring their slaves to the college when slavery was uh, 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 the, th the thing to do. I guess it's like now like the $1,000 iPhone. Uh, you have a $1,000 iPhone now, but uh, maybe 200 years ago you'd have a your own personal slave. So uh, what's your comment about that idea? I, I like uh, I like how you brought up a couple of interesting points already. The, I, I was looking into the Ivy League, and it turns out that seven of those eight colleges were founded by strong like, religious councils and, and, and divinity, you know, people of religious orders, Calvinists, the, the uh, Church of England, uh, and then... For example, Brown was Baptist, although Brown is the only one that apparently in its con in the way it was written, people were not expected to pass any religious tests or have any sort of particular belief. But the council was headed by a number of Baptists, I believe Protestants and other uh, Christians at the time. Uh, except for Cornell. Cornell was not established until 1865, um, I think in celebration or rather in recognition of the Battle of Gettysburg. Okay. That's unofficial. That's interesting. Uh, That's well, unofficial. And it's a little bit uh, maybe inflammatory a statement, but I think that it's an interesting year, right? And what an interesting year. They certainly didn't take slaves to campus at that point. Your point about slaves being allowed on campus, that's true. And in fact, there were not even a mixing of genders, not to skip past the race issue too quickly, but there was not even a mixing of genders. So amongst the, you know, the white elite that went to these schools, the women were always kept separately. And when I was looking into this, it's very interesting to know that 
Columbia never had a sister school, as far as I understand. They were also the, let's just go past that. The uh, the Seven Sisters, which is a mountain range down here, okay. they apparently rep are uh, associated with seven different all-female or mostly female, if not all-female colleges, including Mount Holyoke, Smith, Wellesley, Vassar, Barnard. There's a couple others, and I apologize for not knowing them. But the, because, for example, Animal House is a is a satiric uh, story about guys from Dartmouth who used to come down two hours and party at Smith and Mount Holyoke because that's where they used to have ladies. Okay, and I remember because when I uh, uh, went to a school in the uh, 60s, uh, a lot of stuff was uh, separate. Uh, when I was in elementary school, uh, Girls' playground was on one side of the school, and the boys' playground was on the other side of the uh, school there. So uh, I grew up from elementary school all the way through college in a sex-segregated segrega sex uh, educational system. Even when I went to UMass, we had uh, the men's dorms and the women's dorms. They didn't have co-ed dorms. Uh, the co-ed dorms came after I left and I graduated in 1972, by the way, at UMass, I wasn't really an Ivy League guy, and I just kind of went to one of the uh, regular colleges. Uh, uh, of course, at that time, colleges didn't cost that much. In this day and age, people are uh, going to uh, college and paying all outdoors, and I'm not really even sure now if... Uh, if it's really worthwhile for people to be spending all that money to go to college because uh, I read a book in the 70s. Uh, the book was called The Case Against College. Uh, I thought it was kind of an interesting idea. And I'm thinking that, uh, you know, in this day and age, we don't really need brick-and-mortar stores because you can order stuff online. So why do we need brick-and-mortar uh, colleges? It's only because uh, the college students tend to be... Uh, social junkies. They like to be interacting with each other and partying and stuff, so they want to go to a regular school. They want to pay all outdoors so they can go partying at these schools. So I think that they could just get their education through the uh, computer. What do you think about that idea? I, I want to say that uh, partying and socializing is an integral, invaluable part of college education especially in this country with a culture that is so closed in xenophobia that these children, rather this generation of children, uh, don't have a lot of perspective on what's going on out there. So you know what? Let them mingle. So you're, you're promoting the idea that when these uh, uh, students at the colleges kind of interact with uh, other uh, uh, cultures uh, that are, are kind of uh, gives them a better perspective on things there. It's not like uh, uh, somebody that has a lot of money and they get in through the side door by mm -hmm. paying a sailing coach money to get into Stanford or something like that. It's not that way at all. You're saying right. that these are, uh, quote, regular kind of students that they actually are qualified to go to college. They don't really have, like, parents that want to have a building named after them or something like that. Some of them do. No doubt. Some of them absolutely do. And some of my classmates, when I went to Brown University, class of 94, uh, I remember that several people were extremely wealthy. And what struck me, I remember thinking back then, was I didn't even know that some of these people were so wealthy because they just seemed so straightforward and normal. And plus of my, uh, I think I would say, naivete uh, about the financial situation. I didn't uh, get slipped in the back door. My dad wasn't able to tip the admissions council of Brown. He did offer to wash the dishes for 16 years, and that's how I got into Brown uh, under the, uh, you know, bring a meal and a child program to your Ivy League. Uh, none of that's true. I actually earned my way into Brown. I did really well in, uh, in high school, and then I discovered drugs and brown women. And I know that sounds bad, but since I went to Brown, we know that we're talking about all the women well, this school. is uh, uh, one of those things that's part of our society now that 
uh, uh, drugs in women seems to be yeah. more on the minds of people than uh, their educational background. Can I say real quickly, the Ivy League drugs, top notch. Ivy League women, mm. Okay, well, when I went to UMass, I was actually kind of not wanting to deal with anybody from Amherst, Mount Holyoke, or Smith. I might want to interact with people from Hampshire College because Hampshire, Hampshire College was considered kind of an alternative college, and uh, that was the focus on the School of Education. When I w went there, it was alternative education, so I felt comfortable with maybe dealing with Hampshire College people, but these other people I wasn't really comfortable with. With. But now, what's your uh, feeling about this Hampshire College situation that they seem to be having financial difficulties? My uh, idea is that because this is not a, a time where alternative ideas are really kind of like uh, part of the mainstream, they kind of want everybody to be thinking the same. They, they don't want people thinking outside the box, mm -hmm. although the people that think outside the box are probably the more successful people. Mm. You... I I think I think that's a good statement. I don't know that I don't know exactly what's going on with Hampshire College. I do know that when I went to college and probably to this present day it is or was one of the uh, most expensive colleges. So, as far as cost of education, that's not exclusive to any of the Ivy Leagues. The difference is and I'm going to say this with tongue in cheek, it's actually worth it when you go to an Ivy League college. For example, Harvard, not to pump their spirits, but has one of the largest endowments of you know it has the largest endowment of any academic institution in the world you know so it's not only are they uh you know fostering an amazing uh community of of uh future leaders and 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 great uh individuals but they're also you know getting feedback and money uh from these people you know i think of the last i think i just read that of the last Gosh, it's got to be 10 presidents. There was maybe not that many, but there's been quite a few presidents in a row, starting with Bush Sr., that went to or were affiliated with, went to at some point an Ivy League college. Was Yale part of that Ivy League? Yes. Oh, Yale, okay. Yes, and some of them just went to graduate school, like law school, for example. Right. Uh, Obama went to Harvard uh, graduate school. I'm not going to say which one. I'm not positive. Trump attended as an undergraduate at the University of Pennsylvania. Okay. Well, uh, I try I, not I to talk he... too much about Trump because uh, it's constantly in news on a daily basis, and I get kind of tired of listening to news about Trump, so I try to avoid uh, dealing with uh, uh, Trump stuff there because uh, anytime you turn on national public radio, they'll always mention Trump there. I th as, as, like six times. As, as a matter of fact, I think that uh, national public radio is a little bit biased against Trump because they tend to interview people that uh, uh, kind of make bad comments about Trump. I did get surprised today that they actually had two different perspectives. They had a, a Republican guy and a Democratic a woman that was uh, talking about a situation. So I was surprised that they had actually two different people there because usually they'll just have one person and the one person is always kind of denigrating uh, Donald Trump. But I really don't like to be talking about Donald Trump because you can turn on any talk show radio and they'll talk about Donald Trump. So I have only one thing to say for certain about him and that is he really is or I'm not sure how zealous he is anymore about having a wall. I say let him have that wall on the one condition that he actually goes out there and builds it. Well, uh, Trump has enough money so he can always have somebody no, build it No, the joke is that he actually should do some work. So, so uh, you, you're thinking that he needs to lay down a brick and have a photo session there. And no, no, no. Like, I think that's he... what they do in this day and age. They'll come over and they'll have a photo session. No, I think he should literally be out there in a blue jeans and a trousers or whatever. Um, let's say overalls and, and a wicker hat. And he should build that wall <laughs> himself. And then he'll get an appreciation of what he's talking about. Okay. Well, uh, Donald Trump has his... Uh, uh, bad characteristics as well as everybody else. So I uh, really just think that uh, everybody has some kind of 
uh, a problem. Uh, what they're mentioning on the radio is they call this uh, Twitter, Twitter trash, that uh, mm. people uh, start using Twitter and start trashing each other. You and know what this... kind of uh, wall does work? The only wall that could work? I'd say they build one big, long Walmart along the border. And the front will be towards the United States, where everyone loves to shop. We'll be happy. And in the back, the employees can come in. So that's the backdoor approach to... Uh, that's the only wall that's going to work. Uh, the backdoor approach to coming into the United no States. No, Mexicans come in and work anyway to fund our big corporations like Walmart. So why not make a great situation where we can go shopping... There's a wall mart on the border, and in the back, that's where the employees come in and go home. Okay. Well, uh, unfortunately, even though I graduated from college, uh, all my jobs since 1975 have been part-time jobs, so I'm kind of leaning more towards uh, people that are low-income people. Uh, uh, I think too. they call them economically disadvantaged is like the, you call it the politically correct word. Disenfranchised. They, I also like that. I My Walmart idea is uh, it's a joke. Oh, okay. Absolute He's joking. Joke. Well, uh uh, I do like uh, the idea of having uh, people coming in to do stuff, but that's what the Saudi Arabians do. They kind of hire people from other countries to do stuff and uh, abuse that. them and everything because uh, these are, are rich people, the Saudi Arabians. But uh, uh, this is a theory that I have. Say that if... Uh, uh, we already uh, do the same thing. If ISIS uh, was as rich as the Saudi Arabians, we'd be praising ISIS. We said, oh, yeah, we love those ISIS people. They have all this money and everything. We don't like those Saudi Arabians because they're uh, a bunch of troublemakers. So if the foot was on the, uh, or the shoe was on the other foot, is uh, if you say that some of these uh, other people might have uh, more money, uh, so we're kind of... Uh, having a more of a institutional capitalistic approach towards uh, a worldwide uh, a kind of a dealings with other people. Uh, just like they were saying, like people in Yemen, they're attacking the Saudis, but the Saudis have been attacking the Yemenis, and the Yemenis are heard. starving. That I've heard, yes. I can only say one thing for certain about the Middle East. I find it uh, ironic and perhaps a little bit offensive, I don't know, to the people of Iran and Iraq that in English we only separate their country names by one letter. Okay. I mean, they're very different. <clears throat> I don't really know the, uh, the difference between Iran and Iraq, only I think that one is that one form of, of a religion and the other is another form of a religion. We don't really want to uh, deal with some of these uh, issues because... We, we are dealing with these issues. These, these are happening these, here, too. These are issues that uh, are happening around the world that uh, uh, everybody has to be dealing with. I think one of the reasons why we're having problems with immigration is that people are trying to get away from some of these situations that they're experiencing in Africa, South America... Uh, people are having problems like in South America with gangs and they don't want to be staying there so they're heading up towards the United States although we do have gangs in the United States. Well, you know, yeah, and I think what's also very pertinent to point out is that a lot of the strife and the hardships that they're trying to avoid are caused by guess who? The United States of America because we poke our, our our nose into not only everyone politically but also financially and we run a lot of the financial market and we dictate a lot of what people experience and how they experience it and we have caused probably well besides the wars we've caused you know I mean people as a last you know means of resort will do what they can to survive and if they think they can come here and make something of it ironically because it's so hard in their country, and the true irony is that it's probably because of how good it is here. Uh, you know, it's a, it's 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 actually a little bit deeper, and I agree that it's something that's hard to really wrap uh, up into a conversation. It's very very deep. Uh, I know that uh, uh, the uh, the economic situation is one of the primary forces for the immigration, but. Uh, 
we have homeless people in the United States, they can't afford the price of uh, housing. Uh, for example, I was going to mention uh, that uh, this last weekend, uh, I saw them actually, I, I use the word attack, although uh, uh, they, uh, a person told me he wouldn't use the word attack, but uh, I'm using that word that uh, the homeless people that were in back, back of the Big Y supermarket, uh, they were kind of attacked. They had a big dumpster and they went in and took all their mattresses and everything out from behind the woods there that they were kind of living there for quite a long time, these homeless people. Uh, Big Y owns that property. Uh, I, I guess they were given a warning that they need to get get out of the property there, so uh, they gave them notice, and then they went in there and took all their uh, stuff out of there, so it was kind of like an attack on the homeless people. Of course, they'll just go from one place to another. They they might not go on that side where Big Y is. They might go on the opposite side there, so they'll just, they'll just move from one location to another, but I'm kind of guessing that uh, a homeless people are homeless for a reason because the prices around here for uh, a living is so expensive that not too many people can afford to be paying the prices. I actually inquired at one of the new uh, uh, buildings that's being built in this area, and I inquired. I said, well, you know, I have somebody that might be interested in uh, renting, and they gave me information. They wanted two. Th 1950 I'm going to round it off to $2000 a month for a one bedroom place. Uh, I couldn't believe it. I said you wanted $2000 for a one bedroom place. And then I asked at another place. I said, you know, I was inquiring about getting a place and uh, they said, yeah, well we have a four bedroom house. That's $2000 a month. I said, well that's a little better. You have four bedrooms uh, instead of one bedroom, but it's still $2000 a month. So that's actually uh, uh, a lot of money for people to come up with. Uh, I'm sure that you pay two thousand dollars a month at your place. Is that what you pay? Uh, no, I paid only a thousand dollars for this phone. Oh yeah, he's got the thousand dollar iPhone. I was impressed with that. I, I gotta say, I figured out the reason you had asked me why would someone buy a thousand dollar phone, and honestly, it's because it's a lot easier than carrying a thousand dollars around. Okay, well, uh, there might be a, a particular reason, but uh, say if uh, Apple came out with some newfangled phone that would cost $2,000, would you be the first one in line the day after Thanksgiving? Say you'd stand in line at midnight to go get your $2,000 phone. You'd be like standing in line, say that they got a, this is the Black Friday special. You'll get the $2,000 phone for only $1,500, and I'm guessing you'd be the first one in line to get one, or well, that's not necessarily true? Not necessarily true, Ron, with the only caveat that that's one of my superpowers now that I'm disabled and I use a wheelchair, it's not visible on the screen right now, is that I don't have to ever, ever stand in line. Okay, that's another reason. He has a newfangled uh, uh, wheelchair that he uses. You were going to show me this, uh, this thing that, uh, that you have for the wheelchair. It's some kind of a thing. Uh, I, uh, you, you'll have to explain what the story is because it's kind of a high-tech thing. So I made this out of uh, brick and uh, mud and spit on my free time last winter. Uh, that's not true. It's called the Smart Drive. I was able to get it through Medicare. It's been approved as a medical device. And what it does is it links right here onto any manual chair that just they kind of give a coupling or they give you some kind of thing you would attach to the axle of your my manual wheelchair, for example. This thing locks on, and from here it pushes. It kind of has a tank-like wheel in the sense that it can rotate sideways and forward and backward. Uh, we don't have the room, but I didn't have, I don't have my watch. Ordinarily, it is controlled by Bluetooth uh, signal through my watch, and uh, you would tap it to start it. You have to tap it to stop the speed. The top speed's about five and a half miles an hour. And you have to, of course, guide it by turning as you ordinarily, as I ordinarily would turn my wheelchair. I want to point out that it, although it's called a smart drive, it would ha be happily dumb enough to push me off a cliff if I ask it to. 
Yeah, you was telling me that uh, they might not not allow uh, everybody to use this device. What would be uh, the reason for that? When I went to go uh, try out the device to see if it was a good fit for me and so they, I could ask insurance or through my insurance for it, they tested me to make sure that my executive functioning or that my brain was working well enough to be able to make decisions and, and because this thing really can cause damage if you're not conscientious and you're not aware of it. Uh, so this is the, uh, basically an Ivy League item? Well, I did go to the Ivy League and it is mine, so technically, yes, you're, you're correct. I did want to point something out real quick before we pass the, 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 to the topic too quickly about homeless people. And I think that the biggest problem, this is something I read, it's not my original idea, the biggest problem with the poor is not a lack of character or opportunity, it's a lack of cash. There's a great story that talks about uh, sci a social scientist that went to India uh, on the other side of the world. And they, they, what they did is they, they took IQ tests and they gave the same farmers different versions of the IQ test when they were furthest away from and when they actually harvested their whatever, I think it was sugar cane. What they, what they had pointed out, or what they realized was unique about this uh, population was that 60% or more of their income came in one day of the year. So they tested them during this time when they had everything covered and they had money. And they also tested them six months before, whenever it was in the year that they were the least, maybe a month before the time they the harvest. And they found an actual 15 point, that's a significant, that's an, as a statistically significant difference. In the same people, they found a 15 point difference or increase in IQ just in that fact alone. They were able to present those findings. I don't know where, but well, uh, I believe. Uh, uh, some of these... Uh, in, other words, in other words, I think when you don't have money, you have to make bad decisions. You're forced into bad decisions, and you're forced to... I mean, everyone has to live, right? They, they no longer can live behind Big Y, but guess what? They're not going to get an apartment tomorrow. They're going to have to live somewhere. And so, in many ways, uh, it, their challenge is the lack of having cash. And it seems that as a, as a, as a culture, we're complicit. We're okay with it. Who well, doesn't see a homeless person every day? Well, they mentioned on the news today, this was a statistic that they mentioned on National Public Radio. They, they said in Los Angeles, uh, 40,000 people uh, found places to stay, but 55,000 people uh, uh, were made homeless. So uh, the homeless still outdid the uh, the population that did find a place to stay. So uh, California... And that's not just a difference, like 15,000 people. That's... 55,000 people that still don't have homes. Right. And that's uh, California. And I, I think that that might be true in a lot of the uh, warm weather uh, areas, but uh, there's people that are homeless in, like, Massachusetts. Like, uh, I interviewed the guy that was homeless uh, just recently, uh, and uh, he's been outside you know, he stays outside in January uh, with his sleeping bag and everything. So he's actually outside, and he's 69 years old, a homeless person there. So there are people that are all year round in Massachusetts homeless. Uh, uh, they had two people that died over there in Greenfield uh, uh, during the winter time. I guess they had tents uh, set up near McDonald's, and I know McDonald's in Greenfield because uh, I I'd stop there once in a while and. McDonald's is usually open 24 hours, so you can always run to McDonald's to use the bathroom or whatever. But uh, two people were found dead that uh, uh, had tents near McDonald's over there in Greenfield. So that just uh, goes to show that uh, the homeless population does have uh, a lot of uh, uh, problems with uh, uh, dealing with the climate here in Massachusetts. Uh, I don't know how they could be living outside in January. Uh, uh, as homeless people, but uh, there are people that are homeless. Uh, uh, you yourself are not homeless. You have a place to stay. And... I'm homeful. Okay. I'm homeful. I have a, my own place, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I uh, is it subsidized place or something? Yeah, I live in the Hadley Housing Authority or in Golden Showers Court. I'm sorry, Golden Court. <laughs> it's just that everyone pisses all over each other there, believe me. <laughs> 
Uh, it's subsidized housing, so it's 30% of my income, uh, which is, you know, a fortunate uh, um, advantage. So uh, if you make citizen. more money, they'll charge you more. Is that basically how that works? Yeah, and up to a certain amount. There is a market value for that unit. And so if you did by chance have a certain amount of income, you could learn, you could pay up to the maximum amount it's worth. Okay. I, I noticed that they were building a lot of uh, units over there in that area. Are they kind of like having places available for people, you think, or they're already filled up? Those are private uh, duplexes and or condos so it, it, they either are or not filled up but they're going to be privately owned oh so that's a, a different uh, uh, thing altogether it has nothing to do with public housing right it just happens to be <clears throat> very happily luckily next to it well yeah I was thinking that they were building uh, these uh, public houses over there because I drive by there. I said, oh, look at all these places they're having available to the, the public. But wait, I wait. wish I would move into one. Yeah, they look like they're kind of expensive. Compared there, to but, my place, man. But uh, uh, you think that they might be charging $2,000 a month for uh, one of those places or probably more? I, I think uh, I'm just going to say too much. They charge too much for those places. Uh, unless, much. unless you're an Amherst College graduate, you probably can't afford to live there. Uh, and you don't have to pay your student loans. Well, the student loan thing—that's another issue about the colleges. The case against college, uh, I think that people are spending too much money to go to college. In my opinion, I think that uh, sometimes uh, it might not be worth uh, the money to uh, go to college. I'm going back to the college thing. I, I would mm -hmm. think that if somebody spends $200,000 on a Ferrari uh, uh, as opposed to $200,000 for a college education, at least down the road, they'll still be able to uh, make their 200000 or, or more back with their uh, Ferrari, but uh, you may not necessarily be able to get your 200000 back that easily from uh, a school. Well, I'll tell you what, I think, uh, I, I don't think a Ferrari would look as good up on my wall as my graduation diploma. Well, the, 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 the diploma is impressive if you come from an Ivy League school, but if you come like uh, from UMass, where I went, uh, I think UMass has its good points and bad points. Uh, uh, what I'm kind of annoyed about with uh, UMass is that they keep building these buildings. They're building uh, every... every Every year since I've been there, I started there in 1968, and it seems like every year they're always putting up some kind of building. There's constant construction going on there. It's the brick-and-mortar concept that I was talking about, and I think that uh, you know sooner or later the brick-and-mortar stuff is going to uh, not be as easy to deal with like in the retail business most people are now going instead of going to the brick and mortar stores they're ordering stuff online and I'm thinking the college students may say that I don't want to be spending all that kind of money to uh, go to a college I'd rather do something online it might be uh, uh, more economical. You're claiming that uh, uh, the social life in the school is uh, a good thing. I'm claiming that it may not necessarily be a good thing. You remember that they have on St. Patrick's Day around here, they get all drunk there because... Well, let me tell you a story about my personal college life experience. Uh, so I was accepted to Amherst College. Okay. Uh, I like to call it that college. Um and I didn't go because my older brother was attending there, and uh, he was my older brother. You know what I mean? So I went to Brown instead. But I did come to Amherst College, and uh, I'll tell you what. I met a lovely young lady that first time I came to Amherst College, and uh, we ended up, you know, really enjoying uh, a nice, uh, how was it you can say this? Cosmic uh, relationship another C copulation that's what it was yeah oh. and I never would have had that opportunity had I not gone to a great school and my brother as well oh, okay so you uh, uh, did uh, uh, successfully uh, have uh, a relationship with somebody uh, when I went to uh, college I think I dated twice when I was at college I'm not really an extrovert so I really wasn't 
into that social life. That's why I have a kind of a mindset that I'm thinking that the social life is uh, for what I call social junkies, but uh, I, that I'm, I'm using that as a der derogatory term because most people tend to want to be... Uh, you know, outgoing and stuff. I happen to be just the opposite. I'm more of an introvert as opposed to an extrovert. So maybe college life might be good for extroverts, but not necessarily good for introverts. Maybe the introvert would be better off just using the computer. I, you know, I, I don't know what to say about that. I can tell you uh, one joke. That okay. is that it's a good thing that the world is not flat because we would have lost a whole generation of children staring at their cell phones. They just would have walked off the edge. <laughs> You know, because you look at college campuses, when I go by UMass, which is one of the places I do comedy, uh, when I go by there, I still see what I see in the city and in the bus stops. There's no city around here. But, you know, I see people staring at their devices, at their palms. It gives you uh, a little bit of a, of a thought of, you talked about the allegory of the caves by Plato. Um, and... Uh, you know, I'm more, uh, I wasn't alive when Plato was alive like you were, but I think more <laughs> of Wally -E and other, Jack Reacher, these are, you know, uh, some more contemporary versions of something of the same. In the Wally -E, uh, picture, you know, although it's, you know, not a great corporation that runs it or gave it up, put it out there, it's an excellent and beautiful story. But it does talk about almost how divisive these devices are becoming or could become. In this story, people end up not talking to each other or looking, even though that, for example, we're next to each other. Right. We would be talking through our phones, even at this proximity. It goes on to be a little more, you know, exaggerated. Uh, in the Jack Reacher example, the idea is that this person who, uh, you know, it's a famous, uh, I think, series written by somebody, by an author, I believe. And uh, this gentleman, he spent his life, you know, fighting for the U.S. military and all that stuff, right? All the great skills that everyone wants to be able to beat someone's ass if they have to. Can we say ass? Uh, I can always edit stuff out. It right. depends on how, how bad it is. Okay. I don't well, have any ass, problem but, you with know, like that. Beat the shit out of somebody. <laughs> okay. Anyhow, uh, so but, but then he comes back and he's like, look around you. Who's really awake? Who's really alive? Who's free of debt? Who's free of uh, indignity? Population 425 million. It's overcrowded. We're underpaid. And we're meant to be agitated with each other because we're we're treated terribly. And we're put into a situation where Plato's allegory of the caves make great sense. We are so enrav in, enraptured and in, in, in wrapped inside this technology and our, our materialistic accomplishments and our social connections that we don't realize that we're losing touch with each other and our true fundamental civil rights and our true ability to get together and, and be common and to share things rather than to distribute them on a digital media that is written down somewhere forever. That's not preservation. That's not history. That's paranoia. That's decadence of the elite. Well, I, I, I don't uh, personally even carry a phone around with me because I'm from the... Uh, the 60s, and I'm not really that interested well, guess in what? those kind of devices. I have seen you at um, Mountain Farms Mall area, right? Yeah. Okay, every single camera that's hooked up through those security devices eventually will have the facial recognition uh, software to be able to place you, believe it or not, with or without a cell phone, because you do have a cell phone. So your location can be tracked. I mean, we've all... I think well, I, I think I think that's one of the problems with the this. phones. I think that people uh, don't realize that that they are being uh, uh, attracted by either the government or uh, private corporations. Uh, uh, they were just mentioning on the news today about some kind of breach with uh, the southern border that. Uh, they had hacked into uh, some government files. They were keeping track of the uh, uh, license plates, uh, something uh, going back and forth there and mm. keeping track of the information about the people there. And now they're getting that information somewhere else. Who knows what they're going to be doing with that information. Uh, maybe uh, what I'm thinking is that, uh, w uh, you know, about government surveillance, I'm thinking that people from the United States might be heading to Mexico 
to go to the nude beach and the government surveillance wants to uh, go uh, cover the nude beach. That's my idea. Well, Mexican beaches are hot. Did oh, okay. I tell you that I'm Mexican? Okay, well, you like those nude beaches. I like beaches. Oh, not necessarily nude beaches. Uh, I love beaches when they're nude, too. All righty. Are well, we talking about the same thing? Well, well, I'll tell you something. We want to talk about real quickly because i got to get going, but we wanted to talk about the term handicap. Oh, yeah. I mentioned that on my notes. You notice that I have a, a, a notebook from the dollar store, and he's got a $1,000 iPhone there. I said, well, you know, I can all write stuff in my little uh, notebook here. Also, he me my dollar. microphone is much bigger than yours. I don't know if you noticed. Oh, yeah, I guess uh, they probably figured that that might be uh, Size some matters. kind of... Okay, well, so uh, he seemed to be bent out of shape when I used the word handicapped, and uh, I said I didn't know what he was talking about, so you need to explain what that uh, word really means. Technically, I wouldn't say I was bent out of shape. I just am disabled, so please. I was just well, what is that? What, what I'm is... teasing. The, the, okay, so the, the thing that we talked about was the... I did my master's in psychology, and so I can verify that these are true facts. That the term handicapped is a quip or put together of the terms, rather, in England, in old in England back in the day, when someone was disabled, the only occupation or possibility of occupation was to put a cap in their hand and beg for alms. Eventually, that turned into handicap, and that is the origin of the term. It's nefarious. Those of us that are in the trenches, so to speak, prefer words such as disabled. Uh, maybe it's not a handicapped parking spot. Maybe it's an accessible parking spot. Um, I personally, over at the Goodwin Library in Hadley, uh, asked and had them remove the handicap word from the accessible entrance because I felt it was redundant and also derogatory, but most people don't know that. So, so they, I thought did that was important Did they actually do it or they were they just did. saying, yeah, 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 we'll No, they did. It. They actually did it. Oh, okay. They agreed with me. There's a sign of a person using a wheelchair, as there is usually, and then right. it said, handicapped, accessible, parkway. I went to the director of the library. I said, I think that is redundant, overdoes it. I did explain to him the origin of the word handicapped, and he was enlightened and kind enough to help my community, where I am the unofficial and unelected mayor, uh, to remove that word from that sign. And I thought that was really awesome. And I hope that, uh, you know, by putting devices down and talking to people, we can, you know, actually get back in touch with what it's like to be social. Because it's funny how we talked a little bit about being social in college. These kids don't know how the hell to talk to each other. All they can do is go online and tell whether or not they like each other's selfies. Okay. Another great reason, I should say before I go, is another great benefit of having a beautiful phone is taking awesome selfies. Oh, you know what I heard about uh, selfies? Just to end the conversation here, uh, no. uh, there's uh, a death by selfie. You know what that was, death by selfie? Yes, it's when you're really, really ugly and you take a selfie and the phone blows up and kills you. No, uh, what, the, what they mentioned is that people would go to the Grand Canyon and they'd actually go so close to the edge they were taking pictures that they actually fell off and died because they were... They were taking pictures of themselves on the edge of the Grand Canyon. They they fell to their death, the death by selfie. That's I wouldn't call that funny. That's that's really sad. I think it's kinda of goofy because they it's should know that tragic. you know, they're going so close to the edge. Oh, I have to I have to get the picture here. I'm over here at the Grand Canyon and I think you're getting to the edge yawn of uh dark humor. Yeah, this is uh this is a story that I heard on National Public Radio. They and this, stuff like this This has been great. I, I very much am happy. My name is Hither. I'm really happy to have been here today. I, Thank you very Hither. much, Yawn. A Hither and Yawn show here. We're uh, Hither and Yawn, so I'm hoping that uh uh you pass on the information with your phone there and say that Hither and yawn. Thumbs up, thumbs down. You know, in scuba diving, this means let's get out of here. It's an emergency. Does that mean that uh, there's sharks approaching? Could be. This is actually shark. That's what they used to say when I came down the road, because when you're a male shark. He actually, uh, he told me he studied what, oceanography? Marine biology. Marine biology. So you know all about that stuff. I did.
you don't really do anything with it now, but you had all kinds of knowledge about it. That's a terrible it. thing to say. I think all about marine biology all the time. Oh, you think about it all the time? I do. I think that the uh, devastating uh, litter in our oceans is devastating. I think sharks are our friends, and I want to just put this out there. Um, I think in this kind of a world, instead of trying to just be nice to sharks, we need to pick another species in the ocean to make fun of. So I just want everyone to know, as a marine biologist from Brown University, class of 94, that dolphins are dolphins are whores. Okay, well, dolphins that's his whores. interpretation. Sharks are our friends. Thank you very much. My name has been Hither. And I'm Jan, and we're uh, going to sign off. I'm going to give you the peace sign from the 60s. What kind of sign? Oh, he's giving the peace sign. I'll of... give the uh, how. You... Oh, and, uh... If people want to check out my comedy, they can go to YouTube, Martin Vega, Comedian. You have to know how to spell Comedian. And uh, uh, How do you spell Comedian? Uh, I spell it correctly. But uh, the thing how do you, you spell should it? do is, I don't know. The thing you should do is uh, don't judge the content by the number of visits. Oh, yeah, because some people are more interested in pornography than regular information. It's funny you should say that. I do have a song about gonorrhea, but there is no pornography. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I think that's one of the problems with the with the phones there. I think, you know, like, uh, uh, or, you know, I heard on National Public Radio some, uh, some two-year-old uh, uh, told its mother that she was abomination, and this, this was, they were talking about gifted children, and uh, this two-year-old told its mother, well, you're an abomination. I said, well, mm. what the hell? You know, I didn't think two-year-olds would speak like that, but obviously they're ready to go to Brown University. They're already on their way from two years old. They're ready to go over there. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, ready I applied when I was two. Yeah. Well, that's so, when my dad started working in the kitchen at the Brown so, Cafeteria. Uh, so the uh, uh, the 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 pre the preschool stuff is important. Make sure you go to one of these fifty thousand dollar preschools there. Has send your kid to the preschool there, and they'll be working their way up to Brown. Is that it? I think that's the way to go, man. Yeah. Do you know that the world is eighty percent Brown? That's the that's the way to go. Go to one of these expensive preschools, and you're you're on your way to one of these Ivy League schools. You don't need to go to the back door there and pay some sailing coach to get in. True. You don't want to pay a sailor. And I also want to say uh, it's important to not drink your milk, kids. Yeah, because uh, uh, there's different forms of milk. What is it? There's coconut milk. Do you know that we have more choices for milk in the supermarket than we do for presidential candidates in this big ass country? Well, I don't know. With I don't that, I gotta go. It's been real. Thanks, Jan. <laughs>